Okay, this video um, will use uh, beam tables and the idea of superposition. So, um, looking at multiple loadings on a beam and uh, using the beam table for each of the beams, you know, for each of the beams subjected to each loading individually to determine a deflection at a particular point and then adding those up together. Um, and in doing so, we'll be using skills one and four um, from our singly loaded beams. So, each of the individual beams we'll be using a different uh, one of the skills, all right? So there's, you know, there is a skill zero here where you can just use the, the beam table directly, and uh, a lot of your homework has that. But um, um, this, we're combining the ideas of, of having a complicated uh, analysis or complicated use of the beam table for uh, individual single loaded beam, and then combining them together to get the, uh, uh, through superposition to get the total um, uh, beam deflections at a particular location. And that particular location is at point D for this beam. It's subjected to a uh, concentrated load at B, um, uniform load on the overhang of the simply supported beam, um, uh, so uniformly distributed loading on the overhang portion. Uh, okay, so um, I've just sketched what I would imagine the elastic curve would look like here. Uh, so it's going to respond to the concentrated load P, um, giving it a positive slope when we get to C um, overall, but uh, um, then the uniform loading will have quite a drastic effect. Um, so the distributed loading will have a drastic effect here between C and D to pull it back down. So uh, in each of the links are given here is L over 2. So the span of our between our simply supported supports is uh, L, so that'll be useful for applying the, to the beam, uh, applying the beam table. And the overhang is half of that uh, span. And again, the, the concentrated load is mid-span on the simply supported portion. What we need to find here is a deflection at D due to these multiple loadings. So superposition tells us that uh, we should think about this as two separate beams. Um, so each of the loading individually. So we have a simply supported beam with a mid-span uh, load, P. And... Uh, the slope here, um, or the overhang portion, won't have, you know, has no loading on it. So whatever slope we get at C here for just beam prime um, will be the slope throughout the overhang portion, C to D. And uh, therefore, we can use the beam table to determine the slope here and then extend that over the L over 2 length to get the total deflection at D just for B prime. And then add on the deflection at D for beam prime, which is VD prime to uh, VD double prime for beam double prime. Um, and this is just the loading um, from the uniformly distributed loading. Uh, the only load here is a uniformly distributed loading. All right, uh, so here um, uh, the beam will look like this. Again, we'll have no deflections at either of our supports um, and quite a drastic downward deflection due to the uniformly distributed loading. I should say in the problem there's no um, Nothing is given here between the relationship between P and W. So um, all of these curves and the, the total amounts of deflection here is sort of made up. You know, we, to, to get the actual look at this, we need to know the relative strengths between P and W. Um, so the answer here will, will still be, will have some questions left to be answered in terms of uh, the total deflection at D. All right, so, uh, so the, the idea of superposition is that the total deflection at D VD is going to be uh, the deflection we get at D for just beam prime plus the deflection we get at D for beam double prime. That's superposition. Okay. Now each one of these individually loaded beams, we can we can glean this information from the beam tables, but it does require applying one of our four skills, right? So this is not going to just be a, a direct application. Uh, we can't just go right to the beam table and get the information we need. We need to do a little bit more work. So beam, beam prime is not so difficult. This uh, um, uses skill one, and uh, so the picture is here. We know that at C, uh, there's going to be no deflection. Um, but, but really what we, can, what we want to get here is the slope at C. So I have uh, theta prime C here. So theta C prime uh, It's the deflection at C for beam prime. All right, so a bit of notation there. But this is just a simply supported beam with uh, an applied load at mid-span. All right, so if we go to our beam table and look at what we have, 
we can see that this is exactly what beam 1 is. So I'm going to show that here. So here is beam 1. It's a simply supported beam. Yes, we have an overhang, but we can ignore that for a second because all we need is this theta 2. Once we know theta 2, that's our theta c prime. All right, and so this is just a yeah, um, simply supported beam with a load, load at mid-span. We go here and sit, look and say that uh, we see that our slope at 2 in our beam table is just, so there's a negative on the theta and there's a negative on, you know, the, um, the, the actual formula here. So those two will cancel and it's a positive slope, which you see in the diagram. So the positive slope at the, at the you know, for 2 here, theta 2, is PL squared over 16 EI. Luckily, um, our length our mid, you know, our um, simply supported uh, span here is just L, so we don't need to actually make any changes. Our theta C prime is just come straight from the beam table. It's PL squared over 16 EI. Okay, but what we do need to now know, we need to know VD prime, and that's just going to be the slope times the length to, between C and D. And this is really comes from this is a, an equation of a line, where we we want to know the deflection at some displacement. Uh, from where our deflection is zero. So we start at zero deflection, and then it's just the equation of a line where this is the slope multiplied by, um, by some uh, distance from that original location. All right, so we just uh, take the slope, multiply it by the, the distance, and we get PL cubed over 32 EI. All right, and so here's where this line comes in. And again, that's a direct relation of there being no loading on uh, this overhang for beam prime. Right? And that's because we put all of the loading on the overhang in beam double prime. And so this is now the beam we need uh, to do, we need to focus on. All right, so we know VD prime. Let's now find VD double prime. And this is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more complicated. So beam double prime, uh, we'll use skill four, which uh, I said in class is kind of the most complicated, most abstract skill we need to we need to master here for our single loading single loaded beams but uh and the, the skill can be wrapped up like this the total deflection at d for some beam and in this case we're going to have double primes on everything because we're talking about beam double prime the total deflection is going to be the deflection at d for a cantilever beam where we're just taking a cantilever beam over the C to D seg segment, right? And so this C to D segment is going to be subjected to the, all the loading, right? And that'll give us the, uh, the deflection at D as if there was no rotation at, at C. And then we'll put the rotation back in uh, due to the simply supported uh, section, of the, due, due to a simply supported beam um, where there is an applied moment uh, um, at the end point. So the... the the applied moment gives us the rotation at the at the endpoint, um, and so that's going to come from a simply supported beam being subjected to a, a moment at an endpoint. That's the rotation, and uh, the deflection is going to come from a cantilevered beam where there's no rotation, right? Because there's a fixed support that's that restricts any rotation. So this gives us just deflection, and this gives us rotation. Okay, so the first step using skill four is uh, finding the internal moment at at, uh, um, you know, the, the end of the overhang, or the, I guess the beginning of the overhang portion for the simply supported beam. Uh, so we need to find the internal moment at C in our case. And so we do a cut section um, where we're just including the overhang portion. This is not an arbitrary distance from the end point. This is, two, this is between points C and D. All right, so here's all our loading. We have our reaction, moment, uh, reaction uh, uh, vertical force here. Uh, at C, our internal shear force, well, we're just, all we're interested in is determining this internal moment, M. So we can take the moments about the cut section, and these two forces don't really matter. All that matters is uh, balancing our internal moment with uh, the uniformly distributed loading. The uniformly distributed loading has a, a resultant force of W L over 2, right? And that's because the span is L over 2. And that acts at a moment arm of L over 4, so half of this L over 2. Half of L over 2 is just L over 4. So our internal moment is just minus WL squared over 8. That means the, the moment actually acts in a, uh, in a downward sense here, creating a frown. Okay. But again, here's where we split up our uh, into two separate beams to determine the total deflection for D, VD double prime. So the total deflection 
at D for beam double prime is going to come from a cantilevered beam where there's no rotation at C, and that'll give us some deflection at D, where I'm calling that VD double prime cantilever, and then we'll add on to that the rotation at, uh, at C, where uh, this segment here is just going to be a line, and that's going to come from a simply, simply supported beam being subjected to a, uh, a moment at the endpoint. Okay, so uh, back to the cantilever beams. No rotation at C. We can go straight to beam 10. Let's look at beam 10. Beam 10 here. Let's see if I won't block the, uh, the light source here. So beam 10 here is a uniformly loaded beam, cantilever beam. It's exactly what we need, except in our case, our length here is L over 2 instead of L. I think everything else is the same. So we're going to go to the, the uh, in the beam table gives us the maximum deflection, so the, ma the deflection at the endpoint, which is just negative WL to the fourth over 8EI. You can see we have that here, but we just need, uh, this is exactly the beam that we want, except our L is L over 2. So plug in L over 2 here instead of L, um, but everything else comes right out of the beam table, and that 1 over 8 is, you know, is instead is a 1 over 128 factor because of the 1 over 2 to the fourth here. Okay, so this gives us the deflection uh, just due to the cantilevered part. So if there was no rotation here for, v, v, uh, for the beam double prime, but there is rotation because this is just a roller support. So the rotation we can get from applying this, uh, <coughs> applying our uh, internal moment to a simply supported beam, getting the slope here, which gives us the rotation, and then just projecting this over the L over 2 length. All right, so we're looking at a simply supported beam being subjected to a moment. That looks a lot like beam number 3. Beam number 3 is here where we have an applied moment at an endpoint on a simply supported beam. Okay, we need to be a little bit careful here. Our reaction moment is over on the other side. Okay, um, so we need to use the slope at the far end so that is the slope at the end, not with the applied moment, is ML over 6EI. I'm sorry, we, I said that wrong. We want the moment, um, we want the moment uh, on the same end. Let's go back to our, uh, what our beam looks like. We need the slope on the same end to where the moment is being applied. So um, it's flipped in this case because our moment is on the other end. But we need the moment here on the same, uh, on the on the near the support or at the support uh, where the moment is being applied. So that's going to be this theta one, which is m l over three e i. Okay, but our moment here is uh, w l squared over eight. And now uh, <laughs> let's be careful here. We found our internal moment to be negative, meaning that it actually uh, will bend into a frown. Okay, that's uh, the moment acts to bend into a frown, so in a downward direction on both sides. Okay, so this is drawn correctly. And now this is the same direction as the beam table is shown. Okay, so it's bending this way, and the beam table was, was flipped, but it was bending in the same direction. So you should be able to use your intuition here, but we're just um, uh, replacing our moment with WL squared over 8, even though we found uh, our, our reaction or our internal moment to be negative WL squared over 8, this is the, it ends up being the same direction as the beam table. So it replaces it with a positive uh, uh, quantity here. Our, our, the moment we apply for our, to use in our beam table is of the same sign. Okay, so if we just plug that into the, the, the slope at that near end, at the, at the support that is uh, closest uh, or at the same location where the applied moment uh, acts, then uh, it's a um, uh, WL squared over 8. That negative just comes from the beam table itself. Uh, so this is our ML over 3 EI. We plug all this in, we get negative WL cubed over 24 EI. And this is where I was saying, let's use common sense. Do we expect this to be a negative slope here? Well, the way I've drawn it, yes. I mean, this is a, a negatively sloped line here. But does this make sense? If this curves down here, 
this moment means that anything to the right here is, is going to be pushed downward, and anything to the left of this, of this circular motion is being pushed up. So as you can see, uh, when our moment acts in this way, down on the right, up on the right, uh, up on the left, this makes sense, that this should be negatively sloped. So let's use our common sense along the way. All right, so at this point, um, we found the slope here for, beam, uh, for the simply supported portion of beam double prime. We know the deflection for the cantilevered portion of beam double prime. And we can then, uh, we now have all the information to determine the total deflection for beam double prime at D. Okay, plug those quantities in. Our deflection for the cantilevered portion with no rotation at C is here. Our, def our slope, our, so the rotation at C from that simply supported portion is here. And then the span over which that, uh, that linear effect acts is L over two. Plug all this in, we get uh, this relationship. And then, now we can go back to determining the total deflection at D, right? So now we've just done, uh, we, this is what we just found was the, the deflection for beam double prime. We can add that back to the deflection for just beam prime to get the total deflection at D. That looks like this. This is the deflection from beam prime. This is the deflection from beam double prime. And that's the, this is the final answer. This is the total deflection at D. Now I should say I started this by saying that we're not going to be able to get a final result here because we don't know the relationship between P and W, which one is stronger. Well, we can make some statements though. We can say that the deflection at D can be either upward or downward. So our drawing could be correct, meaning that the W was strong enough to push it down at the end. Or perhaps P is strong and W is weak. This would then act upward. It would still curve uh, to have a downward effect in the overhang part, but it wouldn't be enough to overcome the effects of P, let's say. All right, so, you know, either one is positive, uh, possible. So the deflection of D can be up or down. When is it down, let's say? Well, that's when our deflection is negative. We can uh, plug in this relationship by setting this less than zero, bring the, uh, the, the beam double prime portion over to the right-hand side, and solve for P, let's say. So when P is less than 11 twelfths times WL, it's going to be a downward deflection. If P was greater than uh, 11 twelfths WL, this would be an upward deflection. So we'll get a total deflection of zero at D when those are exactly equal, when P equals 11 twelfths W times L. Okay, so, but what we're seeing here is that when P is relatively weak, we should expect to see a downward deflection total. That's the picture that I've drawn here. If P is relatively weak compared to W in some you know, that we, we found the quantitative relationship. We can just imagine if P is pretty small, W will be strong enough to make this negative in the end. If P now becomes bigger than that, that critical quantity, um, we'll have an upward. And if they just have the right relationship, uh, so that P is 11 twelfths times WL, then this deflection will come directly back to zero uh, at, at point D.